What's up, Fathom Church? We are so glad that you're joining us today. If this is the first time that you've ever joined us online, um, we believe, you know, that honestly, we'd rather meet in person, but uh, we know that we have a God that is above all of this and that we're going to meet online and uh, we're going to gather together on here. And we know that God hears our worship. So this morning we want to worship and we want to sing. And we want to have communion together because we know that God still hears those things, still sees those things. And God loves us through this. Uh, it says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28, that since we are receiving a kingdom of God that cannot be shaken, that we should worship God. And, and we're going to do that to get today. Uh, we're going to worship in, uh, in singing and in communion. We're going to hear the word. And, uh, and we just know that God is going to do some amazing things in all of our lives. So uh, this morning, I encourage you to engage. Uh, if, if you're in your house and you're in your living room, don't be afraid to stand up, lift your arms and worship. Uh, don't be afraid to, to really dig in and listen to the words that's being spoken. And, uh, and we know that God hears those things. And so uh, let's, this morning as we, as we start worship, let's stand up. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for everything that you've given us. God, you are a great God. We know that you are here with us. We know that even though we're gathered apart, your church is huge and your church is making gigantic ways of, uh, of helping people in this nation, God. And we know that you're gonna continue to do that. So God, just come into the homes and, and let your Holy Spirit just fill us, God, as we worship this morning. Come on, let's worship.
Every war he wins. 
can tell from any giant. Oh, I know how the story ends. I know, I know how this story ends. And I'm gonna see your victory. I'm gonna see your victory for the past. Mark chapter 14, it talks about the institution of the, of the Last Supper. And, you know, every week we come to the table here at Fathom and we celebrate and we remember. And so today, right there in your living room, or if you're sitting with the computer on your bed, or if you're in the kitchen sitting at your own table, I just invite you to grab the elements, juice, cracker, whatever you have, and just remember and thank the Lord for his sacrifice. This is something that we do every week, and that's just to keep the main thing the main thing. And kids, if you're sitting in the room and you're wondering what's going on, or maybe this is your first time ever taking communion, just know that you have a Father that loves you, and that when you take this, it is taking in the body and the blood, and it's remembering his sacrifice. At the end, when after he gives them the cup, and the bread, he's, the verse 26 says, And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. 
And I just love that part because here we are, we're about to sing a song. You guys are taking communion. And that's just so beautiful. It brings us right into the presence of the Lord. So worship with us this morning as we sing. so much for being with us today. Lord, we're so grateful for everything that you've done, Lord. For this week, God, that you've given us the time alone, Lord. As hard and painful as it can be sometimes, we know that you are faithful, God. You are always there. In your grace, your presence, it's 
enough for us, Father. Just enough for today, Lord. I just, I pray for the congregation today, wherever they're at right now. I just pray your blessing and favor upon them. And I pray right now that wherever they're sitting, that they can find you. I pray, Lord, that we can listen, learn, and understand as the word spoken today, Father. And I hope it blesses each and every one out there. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What's up? It's so good to be with you again. We are in week two of a series called Jesus at the Center. Hey, if you're a guest with us, we're thankful you're here and pray that you'll lean in in this season as we're just asking ourselves the question really rhetorically, is Jesus at the center of my life? And I think in this season where all of us are trying to figure out what the new normal is, you know, wondering is physical distancing going to be the new normal? Are endless Zoom calls the new normal? Are there really going to be no sports? Like, is this really the, the new normal? I think I hear just a collective groan among many of you sports fans out there like me. Like, is this the new normal? And, um, you know, I, I, I think many of us, there really isn't a normal right now. And, and I don't think we're going to know what that is. But I think the Lord just keeps reminding me that really the only thing that's normal that can be expected is his faithfulness and we can trust in him. And I think if God's speaking anything through this series, it's to be reminded of that fact that we need to place our life uh, and trust uh, in him in a season which the, the, the markets are crashing. I believe the love of God is also crashing in. In a season where we're physically distant, I, I believe that God is drawing us closer to him. In the season where it feels like everything is turned upside down, God wants to set everything right side up in our life as we put our life and our trust in him. And so I'm excited to, to lean in here uh, with you this week as we uh, lean into a, a text in uh, 1 Peter chapter 2. We're going to read verses 1 through 5 uh, th- today. And a- as we do, I think we're going to see something right in the middle there that really gets us started in, in the right place as Christ, as the solid rock to, to build our, our life upon. Let's look at 1 Peter 2 verses 1 through 5. It says this, Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind, uh, like newborn babies crave spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Now that you've tasted that the Lord is good, as you've come to him, or as you come to him, the living stone rejected by humans and but chosen by God and precious to him, you also like living stones are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. I want to bring you into a little bit of the context of what Peter is talking about. Yeah, this is Peter writing to a church that's in Asia Minor, kind of modern day Turkey. And, and they're really a, a Gentile people there. They don't have like a, a deep church background, if you will. They don't have a Jewish heritage. Uh, they don't have a Christian heritage. They, they're just uh, folks that uh, have come to know Jesus. And now the suffering is setting in. Like they've got some suffering that they're in, enduring there in first century Asia Minor. And Peter's writing to them because like we looked at last week with Gestus and Dismas, that suffering can provoke two responses in us. Um, and, and for them, Peter is trying to push it in one direction that somehow through all this suffering, it would uh, allow an enriching of their identity in Christ. It would allow a, a deepening and a maturing in their salvation. It would uh, bring them back to what it means to be the family of God and that they've been adopted into a family. And it might call them out into the destiny that they have on their life to be a holy and royal priesthood. And really those four things, uh, identity and maturity and and family and destiny are really the four things that I want to share as we learn to build our lives upon Jesus with Jesus at uh, the center. uh, He really sets it right there in the middle as he calls Christ 
uh, the living stone. This is a, a unique phrase that we don't see used a lot, a, a unique metaphor to talk about Jesus. Uh, when we talk about stones and pillars, uh, I, I think about being in Cambodia years ago. Uh, we were doing some ministry there and helping build houses. You were helping build houses there uh, years ago, uh, right around the corner from where Mark and Carrie Twine are. Hey, Mark and Carrie, uh, some of our, our missionary uh, pals that are uh, back in Cambodia right now. We're so thankful for your ministry, but uh, right around the corner from where they live is one of the, the wonders of the world called Angkor Wat. It literally means earth temple. And I remember uh, riding an elephant around Angkor Wat. It was like one of the coolest experiences of my life. And, and as we did that, I, I just re- remember hearing these stories about these giant stones. I mean, they're just enormous stones and they have these little holes in them. And they said that they came from some mountain, whether it's, I can't remember if it was from uh, the Himalayas in, in China or somewhere in Thailand, but that the, the elephants had carried these giant stones a thousand years ago when Angkor Wat was built. Uh, they had carried them there. And I just remember these, like the whole, it's like an earth temple. It's just like all these stones put together to make this incredible wonder of the world. Look it up. Um, and, and I just remember looking at these stones that they're just unmovable. They look the same that they probably looked a thousand years ago. And when Peter is, is calling Jesus, the living stone, that's the image that comes to my mind that he is the solid rock on which we can build our foundation. I remember walking on Angkor Wat and the stones are just so big and like nothing moves. There's no, there's no pebbles put together here. It is a solid rock. And that's the metaphor that Peter is calling to the, the church in, in Asia Minor. He's saying, hey, as you come to him, as you put your life, as you put Jesus at the center, as you make him the foundation of your life, Hey, he's secure. Like he is a solid rock. He's not changing. He's the everlasting God. And Man, in our day and age right now, as we look around at at some of the pillars, some of the rocks of industry, some of the things that we thought we could always count on, our our favorite sports being on TV, our favorite restaurants being open for business, our stocks, you know, at at where we thought they were going to be, the markets are crashing. We see so many things in this life and it really just brings us back to the, the simple truth that Jesus is the only one worth building our life on. He's not just a stone. He is a living stone. He's alive and he is with us and fighting for us. And he is always faithful and we can count on him. I think in this season, so many things are being revealed that we've built our lives on. We've, maybe we've built our life on our own success. Maybe our own wealth that we were building for ourselves. Maybe on happiness. Maybe on popularity in our social life. I don't know those pillars maybe in your life. And all those things are good and they're nice. But I think at the end of the day, we'll realize they're not worth building our life upon. But Jesus, the living stone, is worthy of building our life upon. And and just uh, one verse after we read here, uh, verse 6, he's reckoning back to Isaiah uh, 28, 16. And and he says that we're not going to be put to shame. When we put our faith in Jesus, when we put our trust in Jesus, we will not be put to shame So with all this going on, I I pray that you're leaning in and you're you're saying, God, hey, have I built my life upon you? Or have I been putting my trust? Have I been putting my faith in some of these other things? And maybe that's being revealed in this season. I think Peter reveals a a few other things in this text. If we really dig into it as he's speaking to this church in the midst of their suffering, that when we do that, when we place our faith and our trust in Jesus, well, our identity is going to be transformed in really deep ways. And when it comes to identity, um, I think it happened. I think we've always wondered what comes first, the, the chicken or the egg? Like do our desires and everything about us just transform in a moment when we say yes to Jesus? Or is it, you know, we make decisions and we begin to move that and then eventually our identity is transformed. Well, I kind of want to explore that with you a little bit. I was thinking back, um, we just got out of Lent season in the Christian calendar, and it's a season where we give up and, and make sacrifices and reflection of Jesus' sacrifice for us. And uh, I remember back in college, a long time ago, Taryn and I, uh, when we first started dating, we were both addicted, like straight up hardcore addicted to sodas. 
And I was addicted to Mountain Dew. I mean, I was like Ricky Bobby addicted to Mountain Dew. And uh, Taryn was super addicted to Dr. Pepper. Like she was a walking commercial for Dr. Pepper. And uh, we were so addicted. And, and we just said, hey, we're going to give it up this year for, for Lynn. And so we made a decision. And then we began to discipline ourselves in that decision. So for 40 days, we didn't drink soda. And we had some nice accountability for one another. Like, hey, if you're going to give something up, it helps to have accountability. And then by the end of that 40 days, we just kind of looked at each other and like, do you miss it? And we were like, no, actually I don't. And I think I remember a scenario in which we tried some soda and we're like, oh, this is kind of gross. I actually don't crave that anymore, that my desire had changed, but it started with a decision and it was followed by discipline. And then my desires had changed. And I think that happens similarly in our lives. You know, when we say yes to Jesus, when we, hey God, I want to build my life upon uh, the solid rock, on the living stone that is Jesus. Well, what, what's going to change first? Is it my desires or am I going to make a decision? And I think depending on the scenario, depending on the person, Sometimes it works both ways. Sometimes it's the chicken that comes first. Sometimes it's the egg. But what I do know is that we can't conform our life anymore to the patterns of the world, which is what Paul says in Romans 12 too, that do not conform anymore to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can test and prove what God's will is in your life. I think so often Um, uh, we we want our desires to change, but we're unwilling to make a decision. And this is what Peter starts in verse one. This is what he says to to, to this church in Asia Minor. He's like, you got to set aside some things. You've got to renounce some old ways. And, and, And I would just say to you, maybe it's some bad theology. Maybe it's a worldview that doesn't line up with God's word. Uh, maybe it's some addictions in your life. I mean, he lists a number of things like hypocrisy and, and, and um, you know, uh, I, I can't even remember the other things that he announces, but he goes through these things. And, and Paul has other scenarios in which he's going through this list of things like sexual immorality and idolatry. And, and, and basically it could be anything that sets itself against the ways of God, anything, um, um, uh, that doesn't honor him, that doesn't put him at the center of our life or, or distracts us from him being the center of our life. And so uh, I just want to ask you a simple question. Is there maybe some things in your life that Jesus can't be the center? Cause really you've got some other things that are the center. Maybe it's your business, you know, maybe it's some addictions in your life. Maybe it's some hypocrisy in which you know, you've been judgmental, judgmental uh, at other people. Um, maybe it's some greed going on in, in your life. I, I don't know uh, what God's doing in your, in your heart, but I, I just believe as you make a decision and begin to discipline yourself in that, or, or maybe you just pray to God, will you just change my desires? Would you line my desires up with you? Because that's how our identity begins to get transformed in the process. And, and so I, I believe what begins to happen and what, what Peter says to them is that we should be like little newborn babies craving pure spiritual milk. Uh, I, I don't know about you, but in this season, I've been craving a lot of sweets. I've had uh, last weekend for Easter, we had a carrot cake get dropped by. We had some whoopie pies get dropped by. We even had some Oreo fudge get dropped by. And yes, it was as delicious or more delicious than what it sounds. Oreo fudge. Yes, I would like some more of that for those of you who dropped that by. Thank you very much. Um, but I think the second thing that, that he talks about here is, is maturity. And, and what he says is, is that it's this milk, like, like craving milk, like a newborn baby that allows us and taking in that milk that allows us to grow up in our salvation. So not just our identity is formed and transformed, but really our, our maturity grows as we place our trust. And as we come to the Lord, we grow. It's, it's a process of growth, a lifelong process of, of growth. I, I remember hearing this story about these two teachers at a school and one of them had only been on the job for just a few years. And, and then there was another teacher. He had been there for like 20 years. Well, and a, a department head job came open and they were both wanting the job. And eventually the principal would pick uh, the, the, the teacher who had only been there just a, a few years. And of course, the teacher who had been there 20 years was super offended and kind of bummed out that I I didn't, they didn't get chosen uh, for it. And at, at the end of it, the, the teacher who, who didn't get the job uh, went to the principal and was like, hey, what happened? I've been here so long. This isn't fair. And the, the principal said, look, 
you know, that, uh, the other individual, they had only been here a few years, but they're learning lessons and they're growing and they're really maturing. Uh, you've been here for 20 years and you've learned, it's like your first year of teaching 20 years in a row. It's like you haven't learned anything. You're in the exact same spot that you were the first year. And I would just ask you in, in your own life, maybe it is simple things in your life that we need to go back to in this season. Simple things like just having a real prayer life, a real honest prayer life of maybe it's real simple things like actually caring for people and loving our neighbor. Maybe it's just simple things like having a devotional life with the Lord where we open the scriptures and want to hear from him. Just the simple things of craving that pure spiritual milk. I think oftentimes we want to jump into the deep end you know, of our faith and we want meat and and praise God for that. We need the meat, but Peter is telling them, Hey, you need the spiritual milk. The spiritual milk kind of goes with that. It's like preparing a meal and it's all steak all the time. I mean, sort of, I would kind of love that, but the reality is it wouldn't be healthy for me that we need a balanced diet. And so that, that, that spiritual milk can help us grow in our life. John 15, um, Jesus is talking and he says, look, Apart from me, you can bear no fruit. Like nothing good is going to come from it. And I think some of us, we're just kind of hoping to grow spiritually by osmosis. Maybe if I get around some spiritual people, maybe if I really kind of put myself in the right circles, then then just it'll magically change and I'll grow. And Jesus says, no, you got to remain in me and I'm going to remain in you. Because apart from me, you can bear no good fruit. And so I just want to challenge you to to lean in and and grow in this season. Be transformed in your identity and your desires. Be transformed um, to to be more mature, to grow up in your salvation. And and maybe we just thought of salvation as a momentary thing. And it's just this one moment. But what the text tells us is that you can grow up in your salvation. You can be immature in your salvation or you can be mature in your salvation. And just like the two teachers, it's not a matter of how, how long you've been in the game, how, how long since you've said yes to Christ. It's really about your posture of humility and growth through the process. And, and I'll just tell you out of my own experience, Spiritual growth doesn't always look like what you think it might look like. I think the preseason of real spiritual maturity looks like pain and it looks like failure. It looks like God cutting off a lot of branches and and trying things and falling flat on our face. And and maybe you've just kind of been a little afraid to take a step of faith and, or maybe you've just fallen flat on your face and it doesn't feel like a season of growth. Maybe God's just been correcting things and you're seeing all these sin and things in your life that need to be corrected and God's pruning. Remember, God prunes the ones he loves and, and that's what really makes you a child of God that he can correct you and you can grow and you can fail forward in this season. That's a part of spiritual maturity. Peter says, as we build our life on Christ, the rock, not only is our identity being transformed, and that was such a big picture that he was trying to get into this church in Asia Minor, that they didn't have this long history that that there is now suffering on them and it could go either way. And I'm just guessing for some of you, maybe you're teeter and tottering in your faith and you don't know which way this is going to go. And I I pray that somehow in this message, the Holy Spirit's going to push you over the edge to just be all in with the Lord and let him transform your identity to transform your desires, to to mature you in your salvation and your faith. And I think the third thing he begins to to shift is not only calling us to be like newborn babies and our craving and desire for pure spiritual milk, but he says for us to be like living stones. So Jesus is the living stone and we are called to be like living stones. And he says, built together to be a spiritual house. This word spiritual house could also be translated tabernacle or temple. Sometimes, uh, actually in some of your translations, it may read temple or tabernacle. And I just want to go back for a minute for these final couple points. I want to go back to the Old Testament and talk about the tabernacle because I think it'll help bring this to life as we see the depth of Jesus at the center of this thing from the very beginning. 
It really goes back to Exodus chapter 25 when uh, God tells Moses to instruct the people of Israel to, to bring gold, to bring offerings of silver, to bring fine linens, because he was calling Israel to make a place for him to dwell. You see, sin had separated and he had given them commands for sacrifices, but he wanted a place for his presence to dwell. Well, I'll try to describe this as best I can. Just imagine a big fence for a people who had just been delivered out of 400 years of slavery. And and God says, I want you to build this big fence in the middle of your campsite. You know, like when we go camping and we have the campfire and all of our our tents are around it. Well, he says in the middle of your tent, of of your campsite, I want you to build a big fence. And inside that fence, there's going to be a place for sacrifices, for sins. And so the priest would hang out there and have this big open grill to make sacrifices. And there was a basin in that, that outer courtyard for them to wash themselves and purify themselves. And then, in, and then there was going to be this giant tent known as the tabernacle. And inside this giant tent, it, there was actually three layers uh, on the top of this thing. One was like a, a, an intense kind of strong leather. And then there was a, uh, a layer of like a ram skin that was uh, dyed red, like blood, because it was kind of like a representation of sin. And then uh, on the, the final layer, the layer that would be seen from the inside, it was made of like fine white linen, but the white linen linen was dyed red and blue and purple. So when you got on the inside, on the outside, it's like death and blood and, and like grilling and like, you know, just a desert, you know, and then you walk inside and there's like these beautiful colors and you look up and it's this linen that's been dyed. And in there, there was three pieces of furniture, the lampstand, the table of showbread and the altar of incense. Those are important and have deep symbolic reference, but we won't get a chance to dive too deep in that today. And that space right there, that first room you walked into, uh, if you were a priest, would be, is known as the holy place. Well, you go a little further and there's this very thick curtain. Some um, archaeologists believe and some uh, theologians believe it could have been up to 18 inches thick. There were no doors and the high priest once a year on one day, he would go in there twice, just the high priest. Nobody else would go in there twice a day, once um, to to, uh, make confession um, uh, for his own sins and and offer a sacrifice for his own sins and once for the sins of Israel. And he would have to crawl in there, lowering himself because inside there was the Ark of the Covenant. Inside the Ark of the Covenant, there was a few things we won't go into today, but on top, there's two cherubim, like eight angels, and their wings kind of sat like this, if that makes sense. And in that space between the two two cherubim were nothing. It was just an open space, and that is where the presence of God dwelled. That's where God wanted to dwell. So all that to get this picture that this is the place that God dwelled. He wanted them to build this tabernacle to give him a place to dwell. And then in the center of their campsite was the presence of God. Well, we fast forward a little bit in the Old Testament and Solomon builds uh, the, the temple. They would move this tabernacle around throughout the region for 40 years as they wandered. Eventually Solomon would build a temple and, and house uh, the Ark of the, the Covenant. And, then, uh, and that would be where God's presence is. And then eventually uh, we see in the New Testament where Jesus calls himself or as a, as a final prophecy uh, in his own life. He said, if you tear down this temple, I will rebuild it in three days. He's talking about himself because we know what John 1 says, that Jesus came and God came and made his dwelling among us. So his presence dwelled in the tabernacle. It came in its fullness in Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, look, it's good that I go because if I go, then the Holy Spirit will come and you'll be filled with the Holy Spirit. So the presence of God is held in the tabernacle. It finds its fullness in Jesus on earth. And Jesus says, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will fill you with the Holy Spirit. And then here in this text, uh, we see that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, that we are the tabernacle, that we are the living stones that are built together. So we are a unified family that carry his presence. And in this season right now where if feels like we're just so distant. We're so disconnected from one another. We're houses all over. I think how we can most honor God is to put him at the center, to put his presence at the center on, on Sundays, on Mondays, on Tuesdays, on Wednesdays, every day of the week, he's at the center. And that's how we become living stones. And we are faithful like Jesus was faithful. We are reflective of, of his strength and his security and hope of eternal salvation that we have in Christ. And so I just, 
just want to challenge you and encourage you in this season to place your life on the living stone that is Jesus and let your identity be transformed and, and let maturity flourish in your life. And let's remember that we are the unified family of God. We've never been connected because of our attendance or our affiliation. We've always been unified by the blood of Jesus who makes us one. And so I just encourage you and challenge you to walk in that as the living uh, stones that he has called us to be. And the final thing that I, I believe that Peter speaks to, uh, to, to, the, to, to the early church in Asia Minor and, and what I believe speaks to us in this season is not, not, not only identity and, and maturity that is built up when we place our life and, and, and we're a unified family that we're called, you know, um, into the family of God and, and called up in our maturity, but we're also called out in a very unique destiny. We're called out to, to be a royal and a holy priesthood. This idea of a royal and holy priesthood is not new in the New Testament. It's actually something that God had, had planned from the very beginning. We see it in, in Exodus um, verse 19, or excuse me, chapter 19, verses one through six, where God desires a kingdom of priests. Not just one family, not just some people who are, are priests, but he desired a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. People who would set aside the things of old. He would set aside the, the things of the flesh and, and desire him. And I, I just want to ask you, are, are you setting yourself aside for a holy purpose? You know, in our house, we've got... Um, you know, like just like the little kid plastic plates and, and, and plastic cups. And, and when people, um, you know, you, on a regular basis, we just grab the plastic cups and we use the same cups all the time. I've got my one Tervis I use every day. And, and, but when people come over, I pull out the, the special, you know, glasses and, and like, Hey, I want to, I want to show you the fancy one. And, and, and I just want you to know that you've been called as a, as a special dish, you've got a unique destiny on your life. I mean, Ephesians 2.10 says that God has prepared works, good works in advance for you to do. There's been a few things on my heart in this season that I just know that God is speaking to his church uh, at, at large. And one of those is that he's trying to get himself back at the center. This is an opportunity for us to put Jesus back at the center of our life. And I think the other thing, and I haven't mentioned this yet, but that, that God wants to wake up dreams and visions. Joel chapter two, verse 22 says, and afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions. And I don't know where that lands for you today, but I just believe in this season. I just want to uh, remind you that, that we're living in, in, in a season right now where I believe that God wants to, to give dreams and, and, and wake up visions in your heart for the kingdom of God and, and to advance ministry. And, and, and maybe that's you today and God's waking up some gifts in you. He's, he's waking up some dreams in you, some visions for, for ministry and for his kingdom's advancement. In fact, I want to pray that over you today, that he has a unique destiny because you are a part of a royal priesthood. Your gifts may look different the things that he's stirring up in you, you may have never even considered for his glory, but he wants to use them for his glory. And so I'm challenging you to pray about those, the dreams and the visions that he's given you. They're not an accident. They are on purpose. You know, in this season, it feels like we don't know what day it is on most days. What time is it? What day is it? Is it Sunday? Is it Monday? We, we don't know. In the Greek, they have two words for time. They have chronos time, which is chronological time. And then there's a word called kairos, which is really about a season. It's really about an opportune time. And I believe this is a, a kairos moment in the season of the church to, to take the opportune time to, to lean in, to put Jesus at the center, to, to let him stir up these gifts and dreams, to put him back at the center, to let maturity unfold, to, to be joined together, to put him at the center. When he's at the center, we're going to be joined together. In, in, in such a way that, that is, is going to just um, tap into the, the Holy Spirit in our life in, in significant ways and tap into a way in which the kingdom can be advanced like never before. So I want to pray over you today. I don't know where you're at in your identity with Christ. Maybe you've never said yes to Jesus. Maybe it's just been, you know, living on somebody else's regurgitated faith. And, 
And I believe that God's planted a seed in your heart and you've just got to take a step of faith today. Maybe that's clicking a box and letting us know that you said yes to Jesus and just w- w- raising your hand there online or, 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 or maybe that's sending a, uh, you know, a text to the, um, the, the number 97,000, text the word fathom 97,000. Let's start a relationship and let us know how we can serve you. I don't know where, where you're at in your maturity, but I believe for all of us, God wants to grow us up in our salvation. I don't know where you're at in your sense of family, if, if Jesus is at the center, but hey, we're coming together. And in this season, we're all spread out, but we are coming together as a living stone what feels like a new normal, it's, it's not going to last forever. Eventually, we'll, we'll be back together. We'll look forward to that day. So I want to pray with you today and pray that God would bring about his unique destiny and calling and, and wake up dreams and visions in your heart. God, I thank you so much for the time we've been able to share together. I thank you for your word that is sharp as two-edged sword, God, and, and, and far beyond what my words can do. I believe your Holy Spirit is cutting into hearts today, and you're opening up dreams and visions, and you're waking up things in our lives, God, that may, maybe we've let be at the center. Maybe we've built our life on, on, on the wrong foundation, God, and you want to wake up some dreams and some visions in our life like never before. God, I pray that you would join us together as the family of God, as we, just like in that that old school, Old Testament tabernacle. We put you in the center, God, for every single home, God. We put you in the center and every single heart. We put you at the center today. I pray that you would uh, release it in this season, maturity and wisdom and dreams and visions, and we'll give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you, Fathom Church. We'll see you soon. Hi, Fathom fam. Hey, Fathom. What an awesome message. Yes, I loved it. So good. I am so grateful that we get to do this with you every week. As you know, we have the prayer button for any time during the service that you need prayer. Someone will be there to pray with you live. So if you need prayer during the service, please feel free to click on that button. Someone is waiting to pray with you. But we also have for during the week when you aren't connected and live streaming with us right away, that there is a place where you can send text message prayers um, that we will respond in live time as quickly as we possibly can. The phone number is 904-770-3037. We would love for you to connect with us in that way. If you would take a minute and go ahead and just plug that into your phone in your contacts so that you know it's there. And so when you need it, it's quick and easy to get to. Um, So another thing that we wanted to talk about this week is a connection challenge. I know in this crazy world, we have found many ways to connect in meetings and in um, just things that we have to do, you know, yeah. we're, we're connecting, we're getting our kids connected with their friends so that they can do some schools stuff and connected with their teachers and you're connected with your job and, you know, you're, you're getting these opportunities to connect with people, but not in the way that is most enjoyable. Mm-hmm. And so I want to challenge you this week to take a moment and connect with someone that you would normally connect with in like a pleasurable way, you know, yeah. something fun, something that you would normally do with a friend sit and have coffee, you know, go get lunch or something. But this time do it in such a way that would, you're going to find enjoyment out of it because we need people and we need to have the camaraderie of fellowship. Um, and not in this, oh, I have this mentality of, oh, I've got to get this done, but that you're getting to come together and you're just having fun. You're laughing. Yeah. I don't know. The other night, um, we were in our, um, group and I, uh, I was crying so uh, because I was laughing so hard at the amount of fun and I had forgotten almost how how important that is. Yeah. And so a group of us ladies got together and yeah. we jumped on and we just hung out all night and talked about how crazy our kids are and how stir crazy we're going. I mean, I don't know about you, but yeah, <laughs> I yeah. need those connections. I do. You find yourself sometimes in this social distancing and staying away from each other. You forget how important it is to connect with people. Yes. And one of the things that I'm so grateful for Fathom is that we have those tools right there for you to click on. Again, go online and find that or text uh, the number throughout the week because we all need prayer yep. and we all need to support each other during this time. And one of the things that falls near and dear to my heart is how Fathom's heart really is. And it's rooted in generosity. Mm-hmm. And with the church being so generous, I found my t- myself in some so many times mm-hmm. helping others. And I don't know how many of you guys out there are um, Netflixing, Netflixing and chilling and hanging out on your couch and scrolling through your phones. And you're having to just sit around and do nothing without work right now. And 
-hmm. Without those paychecks, it's a little hard um, yeah. on our mind sometimes to think about what's going to be the next in, next in the journey. And that's what uh, Christian brothers and sisters are there for. And that's yeah. what Fathom is there for. And I just want to personally thank Fathom for being generous. In uh, Proverbs um, 1125, it says, a generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Amen. And um, I know it feels good to help others. Mm -hmm. And in a time of my need, it's so nice when others help me. So yes. it's a great circle that keeps on going. So with that said, Fathom, I hope that you have a great week. I hope that you are empowered and you know that God is for you and with him for you um, who can stand against you. So with that said, I hope Amen. you have a great week. <laughs> please connect, please text, and please reach out to your church and um, as you enjoy the rest of your week. I hope you have a great week. We love you. See you later. Love you guys. Oh, 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 oh